Broadway, a dazzling beacon of glamour and beauty, the epitome of the American theatre scene. Can you imagine that there was once a time when the glittering heart of New York City's theatre district was once a crumbling wasteland of vice and disrepair? Through a wild journey from highbrow theatre to the seediness of peep shows, this neighbourhood teetered on the edge of ruin. It's a tale of a dying giant, miraculously revived by the most unlikely of saviours, determined to tell a fitting story of beauty and a beast. Originally known as Long Acre Square, renamed after the New York Times took up residency in 1904, Times Square has a long history of being an entertainment hotspot in New York. As early as the 1880s, the neighborhood began to transform, and in the early 1900s, New York's ambitious theater community called the district and its surrounding streets home. Now an entertainment hotspot, the area would be home to honky-tonks, dance halls, and 13 theaters. It was a place for song and dance both off and on the stage. It seemed unstoppable. Despite the social and economic fallout of the Great Depression and World War II, Broadway's theatrical scene was entering a golden age and still managed to see success thanks to the blockbuster hit Oklahoma. Opening in 1943, it ran for 2,212 performances. According to Jen Kenrick's writings on Broadway musicals, every season saw new stage musicals send songs to the top of the charts. Public demand, a booming economy, and abundant creative talent kept Broadway hopping. To this day, the shows of the 1950s form the core of the musical theatre repertory. But for a golden age to be defined, there needs to be an end, and it was peering around the corner. Broadway theatre was booming, but Times Square was decaying around it. The one-two punch of the Great Depression and World War II dramatically changed the area for the worse. The number of legitimate productions began to decline, and the theatres themselves were closing in droves. In the 1950s, the city would attempt to change zoning laws to stop the growth of disreputable businesses. This would ultimately fail and only accelerated the decline into the 1960s. The introduction and success of the 25 cent peep show would further encourage enterprising individuals to deal in less than family friendly businesses. As one scholar notes, the libertarianism of the 60s changed the meaning of obscene. It was now more socially acceptable to purchase from and visit these adult establishments. By the 1980s, Times Square had become a juxtaposition of entertainment. The theatre was often seen as a highbrow offering and the lowbrow peep shows. Though progressive shows such as the musical Hair would try to blur that line at times, much to the disgust and outrage of traditional theatre goers. Following decades of neglect, conversion and demolition, it was time to bring theatres back to Times Square and remove the cheap cinemas and adult entertainment. But it wasn't going to be easy. Over the next decade, the project would see countless false starts and dead stops. New York State had used its power to condemn and acquire property along 42nd Street to turn them into major business offices. But developer after developer didn't want to tackle the project, and the early 1990s recession didn't help. 240 businesses were forced out, and their stores and cinemas closed. But with the market collapse, nothing would replace them, and the area started looking worse than ever. A trove of sex, drugs, and abandoned buildings. Not exactly what developers look for in a future project. Tourists were still visiting Times Square in droves for Broadway, but were no longer welcomed by the expected glitz and glamour. And this was all about to change, thanks to a certain rodent. On a windy summer day in 1993, David L. Malmuth, a top Disney executive, was making his way along 42nd Street in New York, in his hand a camera that captured crumbling theatres, shuttered storefronts, and not much else. This footage was to be taken back to the board and shown to his bosses that were toying with a radical idea, lending Disney's name to a street known for urban decay and seediness. The 1990s were an interesting time for Disney. Disneyland Paris had flopped, Disney's America in Virginia was cancelled, and now the struggling company had its sights on a crime-ridden block in Manhattan. To Disney CEO Michael Eisner though, he didn't see it as depravity. He saw 42nd Street as the Main Street USA of show business. I think the Disney brand is going to be enhanced by being on 42nd Street, Eisner insisted. 
It's a magic word and a magic place. Despite his historical reputation, Eisner was the perfect leadership pioneer for the Walt Disney Company. For every failure, such as Disneyland Paris, Eisner saw equal success with a juxtaposed animation renaissance. He was willing to take risks, and with the booming success of the animated Beauty and the Beast, it was the perfect opportunity to produce their first ever major theatrical production. But to produce a show on Broadway, you need a theatre, and Disney wanted their own. One of the first Broadway venues to open in the Times Square neighbourhood, the New Amsterdam, was constructed in 1902. For the next few decades, it would host numerous musicals, and by 1934, it was the only legitimate theatre on 42nd Street. Three years later, it too would close, selling off to become a movie theatre on one condition, that it would never host a burlesque show. By the late 1970s, the theatre was dilapidated and dangerous. Two armed guards and a patron were killed in the theatre. A restoration project began in the mid-1980s, but was abandoned partway through, leaving the theatre exposed to the elements and rotting, causing chunks of the walls and roof to collapse. After the high-profile failures of Disney's America, Euro Disneyland, and Westcott, Disney needed a successful development, and the new Amsterdam would provide that opportunity. Despite Disney's friendly facade, they were a relentless negotiator, and it made sense. For Disney, there was a whole lot more than money on the line. Their entire brand identity was at risk, and they didn't want their newly renovated theatre being right next door to a peep show. Disney and city officials went back and forth, but New York knew that Disney's name was the key to changing Times Square. Disney would eventually agree to put up $8 million to renovate the theatre, and the city agreed to provide more than $30 million to them in low-interest loans. By Disney's standards, this was a small deal, but their name was almost priceless. In the end, Disney had got more than money. They had assurances from the city that no unsavoury businesses would be in Times Square while they were there. With Disney signed, it was just a matter of time before others were interested too. One of the next major deals was for an entertainment complex that would include a Madame Tussaud wax museum and a theatre. Just across the road, a luxury hotel and entertainment complex was soon under construction, and the rest is history. Times Square would see almost $2 billion in redevelopment, now home to more theatres, cinemas, stores, restaurants and hotels than ever before. Disney gave other companies faith in investing in the area, because if America's most known and wholesome family brand was trusted here, pretty much any other company could too. At one stage, there was even plans for a Disney Vacation Club development to be built right across the road from New Amsterdam. Disney would complete their restoration on the New Amsterdam Theatre on April 2nd, 1997, unfortunately missing the deadline to debut Beauty and the Beast, which instead opened at the Palace Theatre down the road. Architectural critic Ada Louise Huxtable wrote, If this is Disney magic, we need more of it. The theatre would welcome The Lion King in 1997, Mary Poppins in 2006, and Aladdin in 2014, becoming the guaranteed place to see a Disney show on Broadway. There's a term fittingly known as Disneyfication, the commercial transformation of things or environments into something seen as simplified, controlled, and sanitized. A term not coined about the Times Square redevelopment, but one definitely fitting of it. In the 20 years since Disney's redevelopment of the New Amsterdam, Broadway theatre take-ins have quadrupled, and Times Square is one of the most visited tourist attractions in the world. Since the 1990s, eight Disney musicals have called Broadway home, with The Lion King becoming the third longest show on Broadway, and Beauty and the Beast being the tenth. Times Square is also home to one of the only surviving Disney stores in the world, and if there isn't a bigger indication of Disney's impact on Times Square and the larger world around it, it has to be the sketchy costume characters you can meet on the street. Broadway and Times Square have become synonymous with tourism in New York City. People will travel internationally and spend thousands of dollars to simply experience the latest hit musical. I think in part this has to be attributed to Disney's success. Shows like The Lion King definitely gave the idea that theatre is for everyone in the family, but having kids go to shows at younger ages, they grew up with it and wanted to do it more. 
Those who saw The Lion King as a child were at the peak age to experience popular shows like Wicked, Hades Town, and Hamilton, which, similarly to Disney's theme parks, now demand some outrageous prices. The circle of life. For review time, I'm Dom. Thanks for watching.